Now it's uh, the time to hear uh, much more from uh, the members of our CE community from uh, different countries in the region on the democracy update. Uh, but before uh, we'll just get to these members of our community and uh, civic tech uh, and democracy activists, I would uh, like to ask uh, Jacopo Leone from uh, OSCE, or dear, another great friend of the Pines Foundation and uh, the PDFCE. We also, uh, together with OSCE, Odir, we are co-organizing the PDF Ukraine uh, each year. So uh, this is not the only collaboration that you will see now on the screen. And I would like to ask Jacopo to present his findings on how Parliament in the region has changed their procedures to adapt to the uh, situation uh, concerning pandemics. And of course, it will be uh, a review of the change of the procedures. It does not mean that those parliaments are actually uh, doing the good uh, job. I mean, this we will hear probably from our next speakers. But now, Jacopo, please uh, join us and uh, present what are your findings. Thank you very much, Krzysztof. And uh, let me thank you and all the organizers and the, the large PDF family for, for this invitation today. It's really, it's really great. You're doing a great job to translate an amazing event physically uh, held in, in, in Poland in, in a virtual one. So, so really congratulations. Um, personally, and in the name of the, yeah, the OSC Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, as you, as you mentioned, uh, we do value enormously this cooperation with you. We have been built over the years and we indeed, we, we very much look forward to, to continue uh, this cooperation in the future, virtually, physically, you name it. Uh, we are going to be ready to, to continue and work together. Um, I think I should have finished my intervention some 10 minutes ago already. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to be very brief and leave the space for the amazing speakers that are uh, lined up to, to, to have an intervention after me. Um, these are these are not regular times. Um, I, I think we are living today and we can all agree through weeks and months uh, that will most probably shape um, the, the future quality of, of our democracies. Um, among the, the wide range of challenges that uh, COVID-19 and this pandemic is providing uh, to our democracy, there is, there is a, um, what we call a, a severe stress test uh, for our democratic societies putting pressure in, in many different ways to uh, democratic institutions, uh, processes, and, and fundamental freedoms. Um, so from my side, as perhaps a wider introduction for, for our discussion in this, in this late morning, uh, I would like to, to narrow the focus on, on one specific subject, as you, as you already mentioned, which is national parliaments. Um, at times when states of emergencies are introduced, uh, when governments obviously take decisions with uh, limited control, uh, the traditional balance of power is somewhat suspended in many of our countries. Um, the ultimate ability of parliaments to, uh, to function, to, to exercise oversight, to represent citizens, indeed becomes uh, anything but crucial. I I'm sure we would all agree. Um, so almost a precondition, yeah, if you like, for, for democracies to keep breathing in this, uh, in this time of crisis. Uh, 29 years ago in Moscow, uh, the countries of the OEC, the 57 participating states, uh, agreed uh, to the following word, and I'm going to quote because I think it's, a, it's very clear language uh, that, we can, uh, that we can refer to. They agreed to ensure the normal functioning of legislative bodies uh, will be guaranteed during the state of emergency. So very clear language. And as a result, our office has been monitoring. I, I've been doing this research on, on a daily basis to see how and if national parliaments in the OEC region have been affected and how by, the, by this pandemic. Um, if we have to look at the Central Eastern Europe region, uh, of, of which we are discussing today, the picture that emerges from, from the data we collected from the research is quite, is quite diverse. Uh, but given the limited time today, um, I will try to perhaps focus on three main findings of, of this research uh, and three main points, if you, if you allow me. So the first one will be uh, a warning, the second a lesson, uh, and then I will conclude with, uh, with the opportunity that we see in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this present time. So first of all, the warning. Um, we see today, uh, today's crisis as, as widening and, and you know, making more visible. Uh, pre-existing cracks uh, in our democratic systems. This is something that was already mentioned by uh, some of the speakers before me. 
Uh, but these cracks are basically aggravating, uh, the, the crisis, sorry, is aggravating those underlying preconditions um, which have been afflicting our democracies already in recent years. We are all familiar with the low level of trust in institutions and, and democratic processes. Uh, we have been seeing a, a growing toxic uh, political polarization in most of our countries in the region, uh, and, but most of all, the weakening uh, balance of power in favor of stronger executives. These were all dynamics, all trends that were already uh, um, there before the crisis. And this crisis is, is kind of uh, exponentially uh, making them more visible and, and more prominent. Going to uh, some of the examples and of, of, of our research, um, North Macedonia de facto doesn't have a parliament since the 16th of February. The parliament was dissolved in the expectation of the elections due to take place in April, which were then uh, postponed due to the, due to the crisis. Um, the attempts to reconvene the parliament uh, in, in, this, in this situation, made uh, mainly by opposition MPs, uh, were stopped uh, by a ruling, an important ruling of the Constitutional Court uh, last week on the 6th of May, which actually uh, ruled against the conditions to reconvene the parliament, leaving de facto North Macedonia without a legislative body in, in this situation. Uh, in Serbia, since the 15th of March, um, when the state of emergency was introduced, more than 40 days uh, passed since the parliament was able to reconvene again at the end of April. Uh, and more telling, I think, in this uh, sitting at the end of April, MPs approved more than 40 government decrees that were introduced by the government uh, during this, uh, this crisis. Um, obviously apporting very limited uh, oversight to these decrees and, and approving them as a, as a package. In Hungary, uh, a case we are familiar with, and I'm sure we will be discussing later on today, uh, the emergency bill uh, the, um, was introduced on the, on the 30th of March, the so-called state of danger, as they call it, um, but it was introduced with an indefinite and uncontrolled uh, um, kind of uh, quality without any uh, proper checks uh, and balances left in the country to, uh, to provide control and oversight over the executive power. Uh, this new legislation indeed doesn't provide, as we know, uh, for a cutoff date, a sunset clause, allowing basically the government to extend this state of danger uh, indefinitely, perhaps, uh, but most telling and importantly for, for my contribution here, without the need for a parliamentary vote uh, on, on this extension. Uh, in Bulgaria, as of um, 29th of March, uh, the parliament uh, reduced its work to, to a bare essential uh, with limited meetings to only adopt COVID-19 related measures. Um, from March and to, to April, parliament similarly in Bosnia, Herzegovina and in Czech Republic have, uh, have had similar uh, limited uh, uh, feature in, in their parliamentary work. Um, so, looking at our data in this sense, um, it, it is clear that a number of parliaments across the region, the CE region, uh, have been uh, unable so far um, to uh, shape um, the national response to this crisis. Uh, the warning then is that now more than ever, perhaps parliaments should indeed effectively perform their historical role of guarantor of uh, fundamental freedoms um, at the time when the high risk of being abused is, uh, is clearly there. Uh, so for, for all of us, what does it mean? I think it means that we need to remain vigilant, uh, to work together to denounce uh, cases and instances of abuse of power from the executive, perhaps put pressure on those governments uh, that need to remain accountable, especially now, uh, and, and you know, lastly advocate for, for stronger parliaments. Um, moving to my second point, uh, rather quickly, the lesson. Um, I think uh, faced with an unprecedented crisis, as the one we are through, uh, a number of parliaments, nonetheless, across the CE region uh, have proven able to quickly adapt and respond effectively to, to this crisis. Um, the Albanian parliament, uh, I think, is a, is a good example in, in this regard. The, um, the, the Albanian parliament in April changed its rules of procedure uh, to allow for committee meetings to take place and, and to vote remotely uh, using virtual platforms for the first time and, and uh, overall to continue their work. Uh, the work of the parliament as a whole has been proceeding quite regularly compared to many other parliaments, uh, at the same time increasing the level of transparency because of this crisis. 
the uh, streaming of uh, committee sessions was not uh, available before to the public, and it is now as a, as a consequence of the changes that were put in place by, by the Parliament of Albania. Um, the Parliament of Poland uh, has been also quick in adapting to, to this new reality. Uh, the Parliament has amended its rules of procedure again to continue its work, allowing for remote participation in plenary session as well as committee sessions, um, including remote voting. Uh, as you said, Shishtof, uh, this is not, uh, uh, of course, an assessment of the quality and the substance of the policies that then were discussed within the Parliament. Um, our office, ODIR, has been pushing and, and putting forward remarks and, and, and statements, uh, including in Poland and in regards to Poland, which have raised some concerns about some of the political developments in the country. All this is available on, on our website for you to consult. But if we look strictly at how parliaments are functioning, Poland indeed uh, made sure that the parliament was able to continue working in, in this time. Um, similarly, parliaments in Croatia and in Slovenia have also to a large extent been able to continue their work in the region through the adoption of dedicated measures, again, the use of virtual platforms, but only more physical arrangements uh, to continue working within, within the plenaries. Uh, so these examples, again, I think they show us that uh, parliaments can be successful uh, if they want, if they, if they want to reshape the way that they work, uh, amending regulations, embracing new technologies and, and, and boosting transparency in some cases. Uh, which brings me to, to my last point, uh, I'm checking the time, I think we are good, uh, which is the, the opportunity. I see the, the, there is an opportunity in this crisis, yeah? Uh, politician, experts, scientists, uh, they are all telling us that the world that we will find uh, after today's crisis will be comparably different from the one that we left behind. Um, we should also perhaps expect that our democracies will be different too. How different? Um, I think it's up to all of us. Uh, so when you know when the when the old uh, system is dying and, and the new is not yet born in, in that sense, I think here lies the opportunity we must seize to make sure that a more inclusive and representative society is uh, is being shaped. That's why I think civil society and activists like like all of you uh, joining in today and, and obviously being so good friends of PDFs over the years, I think uh, you um, might already have uh, already a great experience to share in this transformation period uh, with innovative civic tools already developed, uh, as I know most of you have been working over the years. Um, so I think it will be crucial uh, supporting parliaments in this transformation. Uh, in helping parliaments rethink the way that they interact with the citizens and they represent the citizens, modernizing the work and procedures, uh, something that has been uh, long overdue uh, from the side of parliaments, investing seriously in transparency and new technologies, reinforcing their voice uh, over the government ultimately, uh, and ensuring a balance of power and inclusive, inclusive decision, decision making. Um, so to, to conclude, um, I believe the quality of our democracies in the post-COVID-19 world will largely depend on whether we will be successful in leading this transformation um, and at the same time transforming uh, parliaments themselves. Uh, it will not be uh, easy, uh, obviously. Governments will continue uh, to try and chip away parliamentary powers and parliaments themselves uh, will pose institutional resistance to, to change in, in, in most cases. Uh, but we as ODIR, we, we think this is important and we remain indeed ready to, uh, to work together with, uh, with all of you, civil society organizations, uh, to provide assistance to parliament in, in this process. Uh, it is by, by working together that surely we can, we can make our voice uh, stronger. Uh, thank you very much. I, I will stop here and I look forward to, to the discussion. Thank you so much, Jacopo. Um, uh, yeah, it was super interesting. Now let's uh, see what the people from uh, this uh, region, from the, the some of the countries that you also mentioned, uh, have to say uh, maybe about decisions of uh, those parliaments and, and governments, in fact. So uh, now we are starting the a bit of marathon, of uh, democracy update marathon. Uh, and uh, the first uh, three of uh, runners during this uh, marathon are uh, uh, Darko Barkan from uh, Zastone, from Bosnia and Herzegovina. I think he was uh, an 
every each personal democracy forum CEE from the very beginning, even uh, more frequent than I uh, participated. Uh, Vukoslava Sviansky from CERTA, from uh, Serbia, also our good partner, and uh, the person who is uh, following Democracy Update in Serbia for many years. And last but not least, Olga Ivazoska from Opora, Ukraine, uh, again, our partner and co-organizer of the PDF, uh, PDF uh, Ukraine. And uh, you will see the presentation, those uh, who are on uh, watching us on Zoom, you will see the link to the presentation uh, on the chat. And uh, now, my real pleasure uh, to welcome my brother, Darko. How are you? What's the update? What's the situation in Bosnia? So, hi, Shishtof. Uh, very nice to see you, even virtually. And as usual, PDF is setting the records. Like, you know, I've never been asked to be so brief in my life as now. So, like, I'll just have these three minutes to try to get into the whole uh, situation regarding the democracy update on the, on the COVID-related situation in Bosnia. So, first of all, I'm, I have to mention that uh, uh, in, in Bosnia, as well as, as in the region, it is like on, on the on the upside first, like you know, it's it's been like pretty uh, a good slate in terms of like the measures by the government and how it affected the the whole outbreak of the of the virus and everything. So in the end, like you know, I think we are the region that kind of suffered less uh, compared to the to the other regions, both in Europe and and in the world. So like you know, that's kind of something to mention in in the beginning. But uh, there were uh, uh, several, if not even more, decisions made by more. Mostly the, the executive in 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 Bosnia that that are at least questionable. So like on the on the extraordinary measures and restriction of freedoms, we can say that like you know there there were a couple of measures that were even deemed unconstitutional by the by the constitutional court in in in, in Bosnia that that mostly targeted elder, elderly and and children that were decided by the by the constitutional court as uh, that they were made without. Uh, proper investigation into the necessity of the measures and also there were there were a couple of measures regarding the the the, the entry of the of the nationals uh, at, at at some point that were that were like restricted in terms of getting into into bosnia so that's basically on that on the impact on privacy that's like something that's probably common to at least here in the region to many countries there have been like you know issues of publishing a list of people that were in in quarantine quarantine either like that were in breach of isolation measures or that were breaching some, or or overall people who were who were in quarantine so like that that was an issue throughout the region and and it was reacted on by many uh, both civil society activists and and and, and parties and institutions and uh, uh, in terms of freedom of information, uh, there was like one thing that was particularly uh, problematic was the special order in Republika Srpska that was basically uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, making fines on people who were allegedly inciting panic and disturbance, but that was mostly used as censorship of media and opposition in, in several in several in several ways. Uh, and on top of that, just to kind of like you know go to the to the big topic in Bosnia, the, the big topic in Bosnia was generally misuse of of like you know easing the public procurement processes uh, in in terms of like you know getting the materials and, and medical equipment for fighting COVID, and there were like a couple of big big issues with that and, and a couple of stories that that kind of. Are, are almost unbelievable in terms of how how they played out in 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 the end and like how the the public procurement was again misused by the by the institutions in Bosnia in order to 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 obtain like personal benefits from that so that would be kind of just a brief update from from Bosnia and the region thank you thank you Thank you so much, Darko. That's, uh, in fact, the public procurement is an uh, issue also in Poland and other countries. And uh, now, how does it look in Serbia? Hello, Vuka. Hi. Well, um, no good news from Serbia. Um, the COVID-19 outbreak revealed depths of the political crisis and accelerated democratic decline in Serbia, to which we in Serta are warning for years. So the, the state of emergency was declared on March 15. It lasted for 52 days while it took, as we heard already from our colleague from Odir, uh, 44 days for parliament to meet 
for reasons that remain unknown. The parliament did not even fulfill its constitutional role to declare the state of emergency. Instead, we witnessed the increasing centralization of power in the executive. Uh, government did not even hesitate to recommend the judiciary and how it should proceed. Uh, they also attempt to centralize information, uh, resulting in even uh, one journalist arrest. For 10 days daily, COVID conferences, media conferences were held without journalists present. So once the parliament held its first session at the very end of April, the government was reluctant to deliver reports on its decisions uh, to MPs. Um, even the prime minister was witty in stating that the government said everything on those uh, press conferences. So journalists, MPs uh, uh, were left without information on the exact amount of foreign and aid foreign aid and loans, uh, the procurement of medical equipment or uh, numbers of infected medical staff, for example. So uh, speaking about the judiciary, this period marked with the Skype trials, uh, maximum three-year jail sentences at the beginning of the crisis, people in custody uh, for breaching quarantine and police surveillance on cell phones of citizens under quarantine measures. So uh, on almost all working days, the curfew lasted for 12 hours, while three weekends in April were under the total lockdown. Uh, the longest lockdown was the, for Orthodox Easter, uh, which lasted actually 84 hours. So many decisions were controversial from the constitutional point of view, but uh, unfortunately our constitutional court remained silent, so we didn't hear anything from them. The only noise was coming from citizens pot banging in protests from their balconies. Protests lasted 21 days, marked the end of the state of emergency and exposed citizens' frustration with lockdown and this executive dominance. So uh, a citizens' protest, however, received a hard response from the ruling majority and groups supporting it. Uh, on uh, April 29, rooftops of several Belgrade buildings started burning in torch flames, demonstrating the power of the opposite camp. These frightening sights causing safety risks spread the following nights throughout Serbia. So uh, the situation, and just to conclude, is complicated even further by the fact that uh, regular parliamentary and uh, local elections were called for April 26. So then they were paused due to the old outbreak uh, and state of emergency declaration. The election process continued after 56 days, and the new date is June 21. So uh, COVID environment will impact the nature of political campaigning, the behavior and activities of political actors will be dictated by the government measures to constrain the virus. Um, and uh, uh, as just to illustrate the CERTAS media monitoring recorded for the total state of emergency period, 91% of media space on televisions with the national coverage was occupied by the ruling majority representatives, with the second half of March standing out with skyrocketing 99% uh, of media space. So with all facts analyzed, we um, are afraid that the 2020 elections might deepen the crisis of Serbia's democracy even further, and we hope that the Odir mission will find a way to come to Serbia with all all these unknowns and join us in monitoring the elections. So I know we don't have so much time. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to update you on the situation uh, on democracy in Serbia. Thank you so much, uh, Vuka. Yes, in fact, elections is also the the, the issue that we we had in uh, we have in Poland, and I had a pleasure recently to talk about it with our next speaker, uh, Olga Ivazowska from uh, Opora. Olga, what's the situation in Ukraine? Hello to everyone. Any governance crisis becomes even more visible in global challenges like COVID-19 pandemic. Restrictions on rights are sometimes questionable in relation to the imposed measures and ineffective in terms of their uh, observance. 
rules of self-isolation as well as the control of citizens in the country were so harsh and effective for such a short period that they become more uh, of a joke topic than a real problem. Ukrainians were given very short period to return from abroad. This caused scandals and mass complaints about the statements of authorities concerning non-admission of citizens into their own country from abroad. Uh, demand for various uh, contractors. Uh, at the same time, EU countries have a big demand for various contractors for Ukraine and organize charters to transfer them. But the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the government want to introduce a permit to leave. Such demand would bring us back behind the Iron Wall and into the Soviet times. The national local elections in October complete not only the next circle of uh, governance, but also the decentralization reform and administrative territorial reform. There are still many challenges for organization of a democratic process, fair and free elections in the context of financial crisis and pandemic. It is necessary to find a balance between safety and convenience as the Ministry of Digital Transformation is developing tools for online voting. Organizations uh, competent in election matters are either not involved or do not believe in an idea of fact and safe shift from voting on paper at poll uh, to a simple application with questionary security level. As the impact of social networks grow, the issue of disinformation and propaganda on the topic of Donbass, COVID-19 and political processes is not resolved. Operation of courts and administrative service centers is limited. Thus, citizens have difficulties in solution of both ongoing and urgent problems. Although the coronavirus statistic is optimistic at the first sight, the numbers seem to be far from reality. Ukraine has one of the lowest number of tests compared to other countries in Europe. As of May 13, Ukraine made under 200,000 tests and fewer than 17,000 of them were positive. Less than 500 persons had died during the whole uh, previous period. I am happy that Ukrainians have uh, so strong community and the will to live but the dynamics of mortality and morbidity are strange. The right to know the truth can save lives in the context of global changes. Thank you for your attention and stay strong and healthy. Thank you so much, Oka. That's uh, that's amazing in terms also the the good spirit that all of you you have, all of the activists. So that's uh, a time now for uh, another round. Uh, three more people: Chandel Lederer from K Monitor from Hungary, uh, Salom Baker from uh, Shape Foundation, and a person with uh, many talents, and uh, also uh, joining us from Czech Republic from Open Society Foundation, Lenka Kovatsova, also a good friend of another project of another. A Pineapple Foundation code for all. So, Shandor, um, how are you? What's the situation in uh, Hungary? Uh, tell us all. Hi, Christoph, and hello, friends. Um, really, just a brief insight into what's going on in, in uh, Hungary. The government, as you can uh, imagine and expect, uses the pandemic for further uh, power grab and is focusing on being fit for the elections in 2022 um, as the effects, the possible economic effects of the crisis are a real threat for Orban um, as they could endanger those achievements that he is uh, uh, proud of and claims for himself, such as the economic growth, low unemployment and low uh, foreign indebtedness. Um, what was already mentioned and, and, and it was the most visible effect of uh, treating the crisis in Hungary was this out authorization act by the parliament that allows the government to rule by decree for practically undefined time. Um, this is a serious thing, but you have to see that all the dismantling of democracy in Hungary happened through the two-third majority of the parliament without such a decree. So the decree is a problem, but it's more a technical thing and it makes ruling easier for uh, the government. Um, what this government really focuses on is have a total control over uh, information and informing the public. Um, 
Orban publishes daily action videos on his YouTube channel. The operational group of the government responsible for tackling the crisis has daily news conferences and addresses the public, mainly answering only to uh, questions from pro-government press while not responding to questions uh, from critical media. Freedom of information requests are not really answered. And there is a change in the regime as well, meaning that they have now three months uh, to respond respond to freedom of information uh, requests. The government is running extensive ads on YouTube and Facebook. One serious thing is, is a regulation or a change in the criminal code that pun can punish um, um, fear mongering or fake f spreading fake news with criminal sentences. Yesterday, two people have been arrested for uh, alleged crimes of this, but they were uh, released. So this can lead to self-censorship easily. The other thing is, um, what Orban probably really aims to do is limiting the possibility for action uh, of local municipalities and political opponents. Um, competencies of municipalities were uh, taken away, tax incomes were taken away, um, party funding uh, was halved for this year for all parties. So this is about making it much more difficult, let's say, for the opposition to prove that they would be able to govern after a new elections and that they are uh, competent in, in, in this regard. Um, one thing, my hope is that Orban's response to the crisis will not uh, fuel apathy, but increase civil self-organization. So not heaven help us all, but we hopefully will be able to help ourselves in, 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 this, in this crisis and do the duties of civil society and uh, controlling power. Thank you and best wishes and stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Shardor. Yes, we all have these uh, responsibilities and uh, good luck for civil society in Hungary. And now uh, the shame movement representative, Salom Barker, will tell us uh, how uh, the situation looks in Georgia. Uh, welcome, Salom. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for having me and all these great people uh, here. Uh, before we start to review the extraordinary measures taken by the Georgian government to fight the coronavirus, we need to look at the context and the, what was happening in our country before the pandemic arrived. Uh, as you may know, last year was a big political crisis year for the Georgian government and its shadow ruler and oligarch, Vidina Ivanishvili, after consecutive protests, civil disobedience and the international pressure from our friends and strategic partners. Uh, the main goal was achieved by Georgian people and is, it, it's to have the new electoral system uh, for this election this year, 2020. Also, you may have heard that our government has already made its name internationally for using uh, fake social media accounts to create a fake reality to attack political opponents and the international organizations, civil rights activists, media NGOs, and pretty much everyone opposed, uh, registered as a media organizations. Uh, these fake accounts were heavily spreading also anti-Western propaganda and sponsoring it. Uh, in December, Facebook removed up to 400 fake pages officially related to the Georgian dream. The ruling party uh, founded by this oligarchy when it's really so that sums up the context right before the virus came in and I'm not gonna lose your time uh, with some numbers with affected people and recovered people because uh, our government did not do uh, mass tests and they did not allow uh, anyone uh, any private company to import private uh, fast tests either so we think that maybe numbers are manipulated uh, what I wanted to draw your attention to is the fact that even though we knew we have such a terrible government, everyone united and started to join forces to fight the virus in the beginning and to follow and get along with the measures government offered us. So the following rights and freedoms are restricted during the state of emergency, which was declared in the end of March. The right to liberty, freedom of movement, rights to personal and family privacy, personal space and privacy of communications, rights to fair administrative proceedings, access to public information, informational self-determination and compensation for damage inflicted by public authority, the right to property, freedom of assembly, freedom of labor, freedom of trade unions, right to strike and freedom of enterprise. So they uh, took everything and they did not stop here and continue to take our freedoms and give us fake reality back. They created the hero image of itself and tried to recover from uh, last year's damages by spreading more and disinformation, and uh, all this ended with the second wave of removing up to 
800 fake accounts, pages and the groups officially related to the ruling party by Facebook this April. So to sum up quickly, our government mostly used this pandemic to recover from the political damages of last year and to win the upcoming elections. And we are not surprised and we are going to fight it as, as we fought to Corona. That was all. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Salome. I mean, this was a sprint, not a marathon, actually. Thanks to our translators uh, for following uh, this uh, update on this. And uh, the last in this round, uh, Lenka Kovacheva from Open Society Foundation uh, from Czechia. Welcome. Hi, 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 Christoph. Thank you for having me here. So let's have a quick three minutes about the situation in Czech Republic. Uh, while I was listening to the to colleagues from other countries, like the situation in Czech Republic is a little bit better, not great, not terrible. Let's say uh, a lot of um, a lot of uh, measures that could be. Uh, pretty dangerous for democracy in Czech Republic uh, at the end were only the attempts, unsuccessful attempts and uh, at the end of the discussion were most of the time withdrawn by the government itself and even the, according to experts from media or opposition politicians they say it, that it seems more like a trial balloons regarding the citizens than uh, a power grabs but uh, it, it, it's clear that we could be, uh, we should be really, really careful uh, in the future. Uh, but it's quite symptomatic for the government, where most of the decisions are based on what its voters uh, are uh, writing on on social media. What's uh, what's the, the the more dangerous? I think it's the the freedom of information or the access or or, or denying to access of uh, of the information uh, regarding public procurement, as as my colleagues. Says is the same here. Minister of Health uh, is denying the access to the information about the billion crowns businesses. Uh, it's everything is out of public control. They were trying to deny this access for several weeks. Uh, then decided to open it, and uh, finally we saw why why they were trying to hide it. Uh, and now, two days ago, they were trying even to pass the bill that uh, could change uh, everything about the public procurement bill, and they could make uh, all these uh, activities legal even uh, um, when there is no state of emergency. Another thing is the the we have uh, really really. Uh, a low amount of the of data of open data regarding businesses, economics, uh, regarding uh, the real support from the state towards citizens and businesses, uh, and especially the medical COVID data. Uh, the the government is threatening its its monopoly on uh, on the right to to make decisions, but even uh, the right to to think about what should be done. We cannot really talk about accountability, and we cannot really evaluate the the, the decisions. Of of the government without the, the data. Some of the experts even say that the decisions are not really evidence-based, they're not based on data that could be really dangerous and uh, the government is not really willing taking a responsibility for uh, its decisions. And if this is going to be uh, a precedence, especially uh, in the state of emergency, it could be really, really dangerous in, in the future. But we will see there's uh, nothing like a big parliamentary elections, hopefully this year in Czech Republic. Uh, so uh, we will see how much all this was only a great PR for Babish's party or if it's, if it's really worked but without data we can really evaluate it. Thank you. Thank you, Lenka. It's amazing that you refer to open data. We will come back to this uh, to this topic and for sure Krzysztof and Rebecca Rumbul from my society will speak more about that. And now I have a huge pleasure. Thank to, you, thank you very uh, much. Bye. Uh, to introduce um, three amazing guys, um, representing Belarus, Franak Wiaczorka, who is the Director of Training Unit of Digital Communication Network, another partner of PDFCE, and uh, of course he will uh, present the situation in Belarus. We have Tomasz Krišak from, um, from Slovakia, from Bratislava, who is a cognitive security expert and he works in open society uh, in Bratislava, but also he's an activist and comics enthusiast. And we had during rehearsals um, like this rare pleasure to see his Lego collection. And I wonder if this time it will also happen. And the last, uh, but definitely not least, one of our greatest friends, Alexis Sidorenko, representing Russia and director of Teplica uh, Technologies um, of Social Innovation. 
and a long-term friend and helping us in shaping the program since basically forever. Uh, so now I would love to uh, invite Franek Wieczorka to start his three minutes. Hi everyone, hi from Minsk. Uh, I feel like it's Eurovision, you know, so I have to introduce the results of COVID uh, fight in, in Belarus, but I, I must say that nothing nothing to brag about. Uh, so Belarus is uh, officially COVID dissident. Uh, Lukashenko and his administration uh, still believes it's a hoax. And uh, despite the fact that Belarus has the largest number of COVID cases in Central and Eastern Europe, perhaps after Russia, uh, we still uh, don't get officially any information. So speaking about the uh, freedom limitations and um, uh, changes uh, which we faced with the COVID pandemic, First of all, uh, government used the COVID as the pretext to attack journalists and bloggers. So instead of admitting the problem and working together with the civil society, they basically accused media in creating the psychosis. I'm quoting here Lukashenko. He said that there is no uh, pandemic, it's just a psychosis and people are not dying from uh, coronavirus. So um, we still have mass gatherings, we still have mass events. Two weeks ago we had Subotnik, that's a community work, uh, work day as it was in Soviet Union. And uh, last week we had the parade, it's only one uh, military parade to the end of World War II. And you can see behind my shoulders, you know, the, uh, the crowds uh, greeting Lukashenko and his uh, smart policy on not doing anything about uh, COVID. So regarding uh, privacy uh, and um, uh, privacy laws, so basically uh, government used the COVID and used uh, the uh, concern about the privacy as the reason to not give media the information about the cases. So journalists, uh, we media, when we try to reach uh, local administrations or hospitals asking about the number of deaths and number of COVID cases, they just say, we can't give you this information because of privacy. And um, I, I must say that we never had much freedom and much access to, to the information and the government is not very, was never open to, to media. But now situation is, is critical, it's, it's extreme. And um, I think Lukashenko in some, at some point he unified uh, civil society, journalists and even part of the elites against him. Um, same time, we have presidential elections upcoming in three months. So candidates has to uh, gather, uh, collect 100,000 signatures to be registered, which is impossible because uh, many people decided to stay home and collectors of signatures, political activists, they don't want to risk. So basically, Lukashenko used the COVID as the pretext to not have any opponents at the upcoming elections. Thank you so much. Thank you, Franak. Again, the election, this is a really hot election year and with uh, the added COVID, um, yes, again, we're coming back to the question of democracy and how it will be shaped by election. Um, Tomasz, um, calling Bratislava, can you hear us? Hi, I can hear you. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, great conference. And um, let me start with uh, presenting what was the uh, first thing that the government introduced as an extraordinary measure. Um, and this was uh, one of the most controversial measures by government. Uh, that was the involuntary quarantine of all Slovaks who traveled back to Slovakia during the pandemic. And all of the Slovaks were taken to state-run facilities of really low quality sometimes, where they had to remain for two weeks. And often they were sharing rooms with without knowing what were, uh, uh, were, whether the, those new roommates were infected or not. And these measures uh, w were lifted eventually, and, but uh, during the time uh, in the past few months, more than 2,000 citizens were affected and treated badly uh, by these um, measures. And we all uh, are concerned that these were a grief violations of their rights. Uh, regarding the impact on privacy, the government announced plans to track their citizens and collect their data from broadband and mobile network providers. 
Uh, but after severe criticism, this plan never took place. But the debate is still going on and we are trying to be at the table with the government to make them aware what are the risks and how to proceed in, uh, in a manner where uh, human rights won't be uh, violated or endangered. Also regarding impact and freedom of information, uh, despite initial ambition to tackle disinformation regarding, uh, regarding COVID-19, uh, the state remains very passive not to be able to address the issue and the government is also unable to provide enough, if any, information to public. So there, again, um, a lot of activists, a lot of uh, ci civic organizations are stepping in and they are filling the gaps that uh, were supposed to be filled by the, by the government and we are pr producing a lot of uh, fresh and um, accurate information regarding COVID-19 here in Slovakia. For instance, our initiative, Digital Infospace Security Initiative, created a first database that actually counts more than 100 disinformation regarding COVID, and all the citizens can freely access this database, and it's accessible in Slovak and English, and on a timely manner, we update all of the information that is needed to keep our public informed. Also, the Slavic government plans to issue their own newspaper about what the government does for the people. And this was instantly criticized and compared to state-run propaganda from the previous communist regime. And the plan is that the newspaper would be delivered to all Slovak homes or, and would be funded by public money. And we are still in the process of uh, pr providing government uh, with enough information that this is not a good idea. So we'll see what the future is going to hold for us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Tomasz, for uh, showing us also this uh, role of civil society and holding the government accountable before they make the decision. Um, that's another betrayal of hope, I would say. And uh, let me invite Alex Sigorenko, who will share the information about uh, the situation in Russia. Hi, everyone. Hi, um, I'm happy to be on this conference, even, even if it's virtual. So um, the report is uh, sad, I think even sadder than from the other countries, because Russia really messed it up with the number of, uh, with actually taking care of the crisis. There are currently 250,000 cases, and there are, there are not so many death cases, but it turns out that Russia doesn't count them, the death cases, as the uh, World Health Organization uh, tells it. So uh, there is no emergency state, uh, but um, it w there was um, a state of uh, non-working days that started in April. And then the federal government just said, well, you know what, taking care of the whole pandemic is not uh, is not our responsibility. Let the regions decide what they should do. So um, right now, every region is in a different mode. Moscow is uh, called by the Moscovite themselves the digital concentration camp. The main cause of irritations are so-called QR uh, codes for passes. So if you need to travel by car, then you need to have one pass. And there was a scandal with the application because the first version of it it would ask to grant permissions to everything on your phone and then uh, as the source code leaked it turned out that it was also asking to make a selfie and then it was sending the uh, uh, selfie to the server in Estonia that would transfer it and use it for facial recognition. The facial recognition is another thing that was widespread. It turns out there are several hundred thousand cameras now in Moscow used apparently, according to the reporters, for uh, actually uh, enforcing the whole system of those QR passes. Now, um, aside from uh, this and uh, uh, and some accounts about drones actually <laughs> monitoring people on the street, which are so far marginal. But the big issue is the new law that is, was introduced on 1st of April, not a joke, uh, that uh, provides huge fines for so-called fake news. And fake news are deliberate 
dis uh, disinformation and deliberate disinformation means anything that contradicts with the official sources. So if you want to report uh, the government authority or any, uh, any police uh, authority and there is a, a statement that says otherwise, then you're deliberately spreading fake news. And the, and the uh, largest fine is 37,000 euros.